Hi, this is Nick Pizzai. This is another in the series of training videos that we're putting out for water operators. Today we're doing something a little different. This is fire flow testing. And I wanna share this uh, screen with you here. Okay, specifically, this is measuring the flow capability of hydrants in the field. This is something you normally would do when you go out and flush hydrants. You want to know the capability of the hydrant in the field to produce uh, large volumes of water. The fire department needs to know these things. So it's a good idea if you go out and do these things too, because there are certain things they can teach you. When you do this fire hydrant flow test, um, there are certain times that you should plan on doing these things. For example, if you put in a new water main with a new hydrant, you want to know the capability of that hydrant, that, that part of the system. Uh, or perhaps when you change pressure districts in your system, you want to know the difference in firefighting capability. Or if you've gone out and had to do work on a, a water main break or a leak or done some, done some other work where you had to move or open or close several valves in the system. And sometimes we all make the mistake of leaving the valve open when it should be closed or vice versa. This test will tell you if you've done that or not, or at least can help you to, to do that. Uh, flow testing can also indicate a change or reduction in flow availability, and that's that's very important to the water department. There's two kinds of changes that you can tell about when you do these tests. One of them would be a, a, a quick change, a recent um, drastic change in flow capability from one year to the next or one period to the next, and that might indicate that you've had uh, uh, you've left a valve closed or a valve open or something like that, or that you've developed a blockage in the system. The other kind of change that you might see would be a slow gradual change. If you do fire flow testing at a given hydrant over the years and you keep records, and each year you go back and see that the fire flow capability or the flow capability of that hydrant has lowered each year by a few gallons per minute. And slowly over time, you're just not able to get out the amount of water that you used to say five or 10 years earlier. That might be an indication that you're growing some slimes into the system or if you've had some tuberculation that you put down because of a very aggressive water that you might need to get out there and flush a little bit more aggressively. So fire flow testing will, will show you about those two different changes and uh, that's information that you need to know. That's different than what the fire hydrant or what the fire department does. So what's the concept behind this test? How does this test work? How do these people come up with this idea? Well, it started out with you wanting to know the flow rate capability an area of your distribution system, specifically of a given hydrant. You put in a new hydrant, you want to know how much water is available in this part of my system, how many gallon per minute. Now, the fire department is very interested in knowing that, of course. Uh, they'll go out and test hydrants uh, for several reasons. They want to know how much water is available when they're fire, fighting a fire, of course. And they also have to give that information over to the insurance underwriters because they will determine firefighting or rather uh, fire insurance rates for a given area depending on how much water is available. So it's a very important test that the fire department does. They need to know that information by law. The water department needs to know that information too. So this test grew out of that desire of knowledge of how much, how much water is available in a given hydrant. Now you can go out and measure the static pressure of a system at a hydrant. Then you can open some nearby hydrants and you'll watch the pressure drop at your static, uh, static hydrant. In other words, you, you started off with a static pressure and as another hydrant opens up and water starts to come out, you're going to notice your pressure drops. You notice one thing, the higher the flow rate coming out of that other hydrant, the greater you show, show a pressure drop at your hydrant. Eventually you're going to drop enough pressure, you're going to see, you're going to be able to match that to a given flow out of the other and nearby hydrants. It's going to occur to you to ask this question. I know I can't drop the pressure at my hydrant all the way down to 20 PSI. It would, it would take the fire department probably to do that with one of their pumper trucks. But I'd like to know that. How much water could I get out of this part of the system if I could drop this hydrant down to 20 PSI? Because I know that as, as they're taking water out of those other hydrants, I'm saying a pressure drop at mine. If I could invest enough energy out of the system, what kind of, what would I get in a way of water flow when I dropped it all the way down to 20 PSI? You can't do it under normal conditions, but you can calculate it if you use this system. And that's what this test is all about. That's the concept behind this test. How much water does this part of my system afford me if I can drop the pressure all the way down to a safe 20 PSI? You're not supposed to go lower than that. So that's, that's where the question comes from. Well, there's a manual that we use, and that's the 
M17 manual of AWWA. You see a little picture of it there, and you see that I'm holding it up. This is the installation, fuel testing, and maintenance of fire hydrants in manual M17. And it provides figures and procedures, as well as useful information in tables that we want to refer to that help us quantify the numbers that we're looking for in these tests. It explains the use of a pitot gauge, and I'll show you a picture. That's a picture in the lower right hand corner there, a pitot gauge uh, that we use during these fire flow tests. And it also provides a formula for us to calculate the flow rate. It has a very fancy looking formula where Q, and remember Q always equals flow. We learned that in, in previous uh, videos that we've done. Q is going to equal 29.83 times C times D squared times the square root of P, where C is the coefficient of flow. We'll throw all that. You don't want to do that. Unfortunately, you don't have to do all that calculation. The manual has tables in it. It tells you for any given pressure drop, this is the, this is the math that you would, you would be able to use that we've done for you already that will give you the flow capability. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. If you wanna do the math, I'll show you an example of that too, but you don't have to go through all that mess. So when you're using a pitot gauge out in the field, you should know how one of those works. And there's a picture of a guy standing there using it out of the flow of a hydrant. The pitot gauge consists of three parts. You've got a knife blade, you've got a handle for holding the instrument, and there's a pressure gauge mounted on it. When, you, when this guy holds this knife blade at a 90 degree angle into the flow coming out of the hydrant, there are certain tubes and parts inside that knife blade that will register as a pressure drop or a pressure reading. Now to display that on that gauge. In other words, the pressure coming out of the hydrant will displace that tube in the knife blade. The further, the higher the flow, the more the knife blade uh, gets, uh, gets transformed and then reads out of the pressure on that gauge. You can then take that pressure reading, refer to the tables in M17, and figure out how much flow is coming out of the hydrant. Very simple way of doing things. Uh, when you go out to do these field tests, and there's another picture of the, that comes out of the manual of the, of the, uh, the pitot gauge itself. The crews uh, have to have uh, tools and uh, capabilities when they go out there to protect themselves. So I want to mention some of those. You need an outlet nozzle cap equipped with a pressure gauge so that uh, you take the nozzle off the hydrant, put a pressure gauge on it, then open up the hydrant. You can see what your static pressure is at your given hydrant. You need to know that. They're going to need to have a ruler to measure the diameter of the outlet that they're using. You could be using the smaller diameter uh, outlets and the bigger ones. So you need to be able to measure just how big that is because it's going to vary from hydrant to hydrant. They're going to need diffusers probably because uh, if you're doing this in a residential area, you don't want to be knocking out somebody's driveway or taking out their new, newly uh, uh, installed garden or whatever. So you got to be careful about that. They'll need calculators, clipboards. You got to be able to take notes. And of course, safety is an issue. So uh, you're going to send, you probably are going to send two or more people out there to do this test. They're going to be trained individuals necessarily. And of course, they're going to have uh, in their possession the, nap, the, the maps that they need, the drawings any records, and of course, the necessary personal protective equipment, any signage that might need to control traffic, you know, traffic cones, if you're doing this out on a main street or something like that, as opposed to a rural area. All that has to be planned in advance. You can't go out until you're ready and prepared with all the equipment that you're possibly going to need out on the field. Okay, so we should get a couple of definitions out of the way. This is your standard hydrant here, as you notice on the right. We talk about hose nozzles. The hose nozzles are the two smaller ones you see on either side. And that is defined as a nozzle that is three and a half inch in diameter or smaller. That's typically what you would use to do a flow test with. The bigger nozzle called a steamer or pumper nozzle is where the fire department usually hooks up. And that's going to be defined as the nozzle that's three and a half inches in diameter or greater. So hose nozzles versus steamer or pumper nozzles. Here's the manual I mentioned that provides tables. Uh, that show you the outlet diameter of hydrants. And the tables that I'm interested in starting with is the discharge for circular outlets. And it lists outlet diameter while providing flow in gallons per minute based on pressure at a, at a given hydrant. In other words, you go out in the field, you open up your hydrant, you measure the outlet diameter. Say it's two and a quarter inch or two and a half inch. You can go to the table and you can look at the two and a half inch column. And then you can look at the pressure drop from your pitot gauge. And it'll tell you exactly what your flow is coming out of that hydrant. Very simple to do. The hydrant the test uh, tables are all there for you. Here's the difference between using the formula that I showed you earlier and also using the table in M17. If you wanted to use the formula, if you like math, you want to do these kind of things. Uh, let's say you go in a field and you measure a diameter of flow outlet at two and a quarter inches. 
and has a discharge coefficient of 0 0.9. Uh, you're going to find a 0.8, to 0 0.9, 1.0, those kind of differential equations based on the outlet uh, diffuser that you're using. We'll get into that a little bit later. It's not that important right now. The tables in the, the book, I should mention, are all based on a coefficient of 0.9. So I use that for our calculation. So they say, what is the, what is the flow rate coming out of that hydrant if the pitot gauge is showing a 9 PSI pressure available? You plug those numbers into the formula and you come out with about 407.7 gallon per minute. If I didn't want to do that math, all I would have to do is go to table M, go in the table in the book on M17 on page 47 and 48. It will tell you, uh, give you a table that shows you at a pressure of nine PSI and a reading of a uh, diameter of two and a quarter inch diameter. I would read and record a, a flow of about 410 gallon per minute coming out of that hydrant. So it's very close to the 407. 0.7 that the uh, formula gives me. So for my money, I'm going to go out and use the table. It's a lot easier to do. So here's the formula, and I want to show you how this works on a fire, fire flow test. Notice the formula says Q sub R equals Q sub F times a ratio of the uh, pressure drop on the residual hydrant divided by the pressure drop in the, in the flow hydrant. And what's all that mean? This is the fire flow formula found in F17. It says, Q sub R is the residual hydrant. The flow that you have there is going to be equal to the total flow taken out of the other hydrants multiplied by this ratio. And that H sub R ratio is something you're going to have to see and calculate by measuring the residual hydrant and the flow residual pressure and the flow pressure, because there's going to be a difference between the two. And that number, the difference of that number divided by or raised to the 0.54 power and divided by the other number at the flow hydrants is going to give you the flow capability of that hydrant. Let me show you how that works. Not as bad as it looks. Trust me. <laughs> this will get better for you. So Q is the flow available at the desired residual pressure. Q sub F is the observed flow in gallon per minute. And the H's are the drop in pressure from static to residual when I'm doing the flow. So here's how it works in the field. Let's say I go out on a field here. And in the lower bottom middle right hand side, I guess, you're going to see a hydrant there that says R. And that's the residual hydrant. That's where I'm stationed. And I put a pressure gauge on that hydrant on the nozzle, and I read a static pressure before anybody opens up any other hydrants. And let's say I read that static pressure and it's 68 psi. I know that's the available pressure under static conditions and normal conditions. So I wave to my two other guys there at F2 and F1 hydrant. I'm going to tell them to go ahead and open up their hydrant slowly and record the pressures as they're flowing these hydrants. And let's say the guy at F2 is, is taking out 940 gallon per minute. And the guy at F1 is taking out 770 gallon per minute. Well, when they do that, I'm going to notice a pressure drop at my hydrant. I'm at the hydrant R, the residual hydrant. Where I measured 68 psi to begin with, it's going to drop now because these guys are taking water water flow out of there. Let's say that when they take the 770 gallon per minute out of one and 940 gallon per minute out of the other, my pressure drops from 68 to 43. In other words, a 25 pound per square inch pressure drop in my residual hydrant. What that tells me right away is that if I'm willing to drop the pressure 25 pounds per square inch, we can take 940 plus 770 gallon per minute out of this part of the system. Another way of putting that is, if these guys are going to take out that much water to fight a fire safe, for example, I'm going to drop pressure from 68 to 43 PSI. So it's going to occur to me to ask, what would happen if I were able, those guys were able to take enough water out of this system to where my residual pressure dropped not to 43, but all the way down to 20. In other words, a 48, a 48 pressure pound pressure drop. I'm going to add their flow together up here, the 1710 gallon per minute, which is what they're taking out. I add their flows together. And I'm going to multiply that by the drop in pressure that I desired to know about. In other words, my static from 68 going all the way down to 20, which is a 48 pound drop. I'm going to raise that to the 0 0.54 power. I'm going to divide that by the other drop the actual one that I measured from 68 down to 43, which is a 25 pound drop. Because all I was able to do in the field 
safely was to take a 25 pound drop while they were taking out a total of 1,700 gallons per minute. That's a lot of water flowing down the street, so I don't want to go too much further. 25 pound drop is a significant drop. I can do some measurements with that. You know, when you're doing these tests, you don't want to do just a three or four or five pound drop. You want to get a significant drop without doing too much damage to the roads. So get a significant drop, the test becomes more, uh, more accurate, I think, at that point, more so than it does just at a few pounds pressure drop. So now I've got my formula set up. I'm taking the 1,710 gallon per minute, which is what I had with a 25 pound pressure drop. I multiply it by these two numbers here, and I got those numbers out of my book, out of my table, the 0 0.4 fill power. I see that I'm taking 1710 multiplied by the ratio of 8.09 divided by 5.69. And that works out to 2430 gallons per minute. So what I've learned here from this test is that there would be 2430 gallons per minute available in this part of the system while still maintaining the safe level of 20 pounds per square inch, which in Ohio, for example, is the law. You're not supposed to go below 20 pounds per square inch because you have a a system of back siphon is coming out. You don't know, worry about that. So that's how the pressure test is done. I'm going to end here. Stop sharing this program. Hopefully this was helpful to you when you run in the field. Train your guys and make sure you follow the M17 test. Thank you.